this computer. All right, we are recording. Christina, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you. Thanks, Tim. It's awesome to be here. Great. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about your work. We're going to talk about marketing Twitter. You've been featured on G2, Better Marketing, The Startup, Ad Week, Next Web. I read your medium. You're a great writer. Uh, mm -hmm. I am curious, and I wanted to start off with a question that was a, a little bit um, off the beaten path, but mm -hmm. the, I'm always really fascinated by background pictures on people's Twitters. <laughs> Your background <laughs> picture really, really sticks out to me, and I have a feeling that that's something that means a lot to you in your heart. So mm -hmm. uh, please talk to me about what that picture means to you and why you think it's important. Yeah, so the background picture for Twitter is Trinity College, it's the library. And I am a Ravenclaw at heart. I am curious to a fault. So books and libraries and the whole, if you're on TikTok, the dark academia aesthetic is just my happy place. Mm. So no matter what I'm doing, I'm constantly reading, I'm constantly taking classes. So a library is my happy place. And that's why that's my background picture. Do you read a lot? I read a lot, yes. Blogs, books, nonfiction, fiction, all of it, yeah. <laughs> Personal question. Yes. What's your feeling on buying actual books anymore these days? Are you still a book buyer yes. or are you buying yes. books online? I can't do books online. I, 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 will, I will do Kindle books if I need to read them quickly. I find that just be, because I, it's just the text for me to absorb, it's not the yeah. whole like experience. It's purely just about the text. So I read probably twice as fast on Kindle. So if I'm reading something on Kindle, it's, I got to fly through it. But for me, books are an experience. One of the things I can't wait to do once the world opens up is go to like antique bookstores and just that smell of the totally. old paper. Oh, I love books. No, I'm a huge book person. I, I can't do, I can't do the electronic. Give me, give me a hardcover. Yeah. I'm, I'm secretly hoping like everyone wants to be an influencer for like certain brands. I want to be an influencer for Penguin because I love their, their like designed hardcover series. It's yep gorgeous oh it's gorgeous that's the only the only brand i want to sponsor me like penguin i hope you're, I hope you're listening <laughs> yeah that that makes me feel good we've had this like battle back and forth with my wife well i wouldn't call it a battle by any means it's more like a mental mm -hmm. what choice do we make because books are heavy and they yeah. take up space and every weekend i go to Barnes and nobles and i come back with like three more graphic novels and like another book and eventually a whole child. That's beautiful. But that's yeah, but beautiful though. Like it carries weight. Them? It carries weight. It takes up space. Yeah. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. I have a room and in, in um it's where I think most people call it the den. We call it the library just mm -hmm. because one back wall, it's just all the books that we have. And I'm constantly collecting. I, I'm collecting Neil Gaiman. So if my husband ever doesn't know what to buy me, he just buys me whatever Neil Gaiman has out. Um, but you just have to. I I love having that. I mean, we, we consume too much and we have too much already. I feel like we've all kind of figured out what we can live without and what we can live with yeah. going through 2020 and the book, like books and music. Oh, I'm keeping them. I'm fighting on the hill for them. Like they're not, I can get rid of a lot of things. Not that. I hear you. And ultimately what we came up with is we can't not have them. So mm -hmm. I have this room behind us and we're having a kid soon. So I was like, well, this is oh, congrats. Yeah, thank you. It's very exciting. Um, and so it's like, well, what are we going to do? Just make the kid's room a library? And then I'm like, oh, that sounds awesome. Sure. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that sounds great. cool. Yeah. And speaking of Neil Gaiman, you, you say Gaiman, maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong the whole time. Um, I just finished his Norse, Norse mythology book. I read yes. it twice. I think it's so cool. It's such a cool book. Oh, so good. I love, I love his writing. I'm a firm believer that if I have to go through another apocalypse, I only want it if he wrote it. <laughs> because whoever did like the story structure for 2020 should be fired. <laughs> yeah. Like if you turned it into a movie, everyone's be like, this story structure is horrible. And like, nothing's like, why is there something happening every 30 minutes? I don't understand. Like, for sure. Yeah, he's the only one I want to author the apocalypse. <laughs> I don't want anyone else's. Like, they're so, no. Yeah, amazing. Um, great. Well, I love to hear about that. That's, that's great to know. Let me transition to marketing Twitter. Mm -hmm. Did you invent this or was it something that you just saw and kind of rode with? 
Yeah, it's not, it's not mine. I didn't start it. Um, it's like what all good communities are. They start grassroots and no one's really starting it to start a community. I don't think anyone did anything to really create this environment. What happened was just what happens on most social platforms. There's a couple marketers talking to each other. A few of us know each other from like conferences or from accounts that we've run or from just agency work or just topics that we like. So we, we constantly have these like tiny little clicks that just yeah. naturally form like the little lunchroom tables. We just constantly find, we, we start finding these little groups of people that we've heard of, or they work for our favorite brands, or um, we do something similar, or we've read something of theirs. And we start creating these little pockets of people. And then over time, especially during 2020, we start building and building and building. And because we didn't have each other to be in the same room with, that craving is just intensified. So what you have now is more and more people trying to connect. And so um, like Julian, it's actually coming up on almost a year. Um, actually, I think it's today. I think it's, I think it's today actually. Um, but February around this time last year, Julian from Adweek created a tweet saying, um, I don't know if this will take off, but I, I work for Adweek and I'd love to meet the person who does, I think he said, I think he said Pokemon. Um, but I want to do, I want to do know the brand who does this. So introduce yourself if you work for a brand and who you want to, what brand social media manager you want to connect with. And so that really kind of created this brand Twitter where all of the people behind the curtain got to connect. And so that was one major push. And then after that, um, Tori Tidwell, she created a job board. Um, Brian Boche created a Slack channel all from and Twitter? all for marketing Twitter. Wow. Um, so you have these little, all these people have created all these like pushes like along the way. Like, I don't believe a community is created by one person. Yeah. Um, it's, it's created in these moments and it's created by external forces like 2020. And it's created by internal forces of just, we're burning out and we need somewhere to vent and we have no one to talk to. And we could talk to our friends and family, but they don't understand what we do, even at the best of times. So they just see us falling apart and they're like, you just play on the internet. Why are you crying? Like, <laughs> why are you stressed? <laughs> so just all of these, all of these core movements are hitting each other and the social media community and marketing Twitter saved itself. In my opinion, we came together. We needed to create a space where we could be really just unapologetically honest about the good and the bad about our work. And I, there's a lot of conversations about what's bad about social. And so many people were like, we'll work somewhere else. I'm like, you can complain about your job and still love it. You can complain about what you do and it still be what makes your heart beat. Like you, you're, you can't just be sunshine and rainbows all the time. So I was connecting to a lot of these people and I'm not like a big hashtag person. Like I didn't write hashtag marketing Twitter in the post or anything like that. But I, I woke up one morning and most of 2020, my feed was just horrible. It was just news. It was, it was people yelling at each other. It was just polarizing content. It was just everything exhausting and negative that could be put in a certain number of characters was just like feed. And as I would do scrolling, and it just felt like I was poisoning myself as I was scrolling. Yeah. I was just like, yeah. if you are what you consume, then like, oh, 2020, I ate a lot of negativity. For sure. And and so as I was connecting more and more with these people, I was curating my feed, either consciously or unconsciously. And so my feed turned into just this really lovely place where I'm looking at it in December and it's like, these are my friends. These are the people who understand what I do and they understand the good and the bad. And they know that there's going to be days where I'm just hateful as can be and vent like, and just need to vent. And other days where I'm just like, no, 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 let's be positive and let's be rainbows and let's be all the things. And I needed so desperately for other people to feel that way. There's so many more conversations about the bad of social, not the good of social. And so that's what really spurred me on to do that tweet, which was those smaller accounts, those smaller accounts never feel invited. They yeah. never, they never feel worthy, especially as marketers, because we're so prone to imposter syndrome. We could work for the Nikes and the Yahoo's and the Amazons and the Facebooks and the Googles of the world. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. And still feel like I only have 50 followers. Yeah. These people are going to think I'm a joke. They're going to be like, who are you with your 23 followers? And so because of that, they self reject. They don't come to the party. They don't come into the community because they don't feel like they would be valued there solely because of this vanity metric 
that we will argue to the sun comes like so the sun goes down that it's a vanity metric, but we still hold it as a clout option for us. And so by having it be like, all right, less than a thousand, come on in, say hi, let's know more about you. And then as people started responding, I wasn't expecting, I was expecting someone like, yeah, I'll probably get like 20 likes and people be like, oh, that's sweet. And that was it. Yeah. No expectation of going of it going viral or or it's still working. Like people still respond to it today. Um, over over two months later, um, but I started retweeting it because they're not necessarily going to be seen. If there's a lot of assumptions that people will go in that feed that thread and actually read through all of them, very few people actually do that. So as people were responding, I was I was retweeting them so that my followers would see them even if they weren't in the thread. And then they can engage and then Twitter like cut me off twice because <laughs> I guess I had bot energy. It was like, you've done, you, you can't, I, I couldn't like, I couldn't retweet. I had to, I had to reach out to friends and be like, can you let them know I'm not ignoring them? Like I, Twitter cut me off. Like, I love you guys. <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like ignoring you. I'm not, not engaging. It's just, I literally can't. Um, and then it's just still going. So no, I, the Twitter doesn't, the marketing Twitter does not belong to me. It very much belongs to all of us. Um, I'm glad that it's growing. I'm glad that it's created a really positive place. I like to see myself as more of like the godmother of marketing Twitter. Like I didn't birth it, but I will protect it with that's every cool. fiber of my being. Yeah. Um, that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. Wow. There's so many ways to take this. <laughs> well, it's really important because I've never been a social media person. I mm -hmm. built a brand on social media and then kind of got away with it or away from it. But in, in 20, my podcast guests basically throughout all of 2020 have been people I met on Twitter. I actually thought about calling my podcast like friends from Twitter because it's the best That's way. That's great to, though. <laughs> well, I, I think so. Yeah. And it's, it's an inviting platform. Um, it's a creative platform. It is definitely divisive, but yes. there are pockets of people that don't really want to participate in that and are more or less exchanging mm -hmm. ideas. So here's where I'm going with it. I, I read a quote this morning from, um, actually I can pull it up. Excuse me for everybody listening. I'm on my computer trying to find <laughs> this quote, but obviously I wrote the blog. I write a morning blog post every day and I wrote a post about um, Bumble's IPO and when Whitney Wolf heard was being interviewed, I think by Bloomberg, she said, okay, here it is. This pandemic has proven that loneliness is not the way we were designed to live. And um, man, that just hit me. Like, I'm very fortunate. My wife and I get along really well. Um, I can't say that I've ever felt lonely, but as everybody else, I've felt very isolated. And so I think that's why this whole concept of connection and community over this last year has has taken off mm -hmm. and yeah there's been ideas of building audiences with online marketing right but it's it's changing a little bit where it's like no you're not building an audience you're building a community and so i think about that a lot and i think about what you were saying with like i didn't create this but i've been a part of it yeah. is is there an issue with people trying to force a community you know 100%. like okay i want to build a brand i want to create content I know how to monetize it. Here's a community and like, bam, stamp, we're going to build this thing. And so what's the balance, right? Because it's a good business model for people. And I encourage people to, you know, quote, build communities. But at the same time, I don't encourage people to force it. So if it doesn't take off, what do you do? Just say like, okay, this didn't work and cut the cord. Um, give some advice on how to match this natural progression of of organic interaction with like guided top level marketing to, to, to get your audience in the right direction. Absolutely. So I completely agree. Community is very much a buzzword right now, especially sure. because a lot of people have decided and figured out they, they got to see the power firsthand with marketing Twitter and also just other, other communities around the world. And so it's, there's going to be people, who immediately see things and think, I need this. I can monetize this. I can, I can, I can wield this. It's, it's this like Thanos glove thing. Like you're going to use it. And even if your motivation could be perceived as positive, you're still using it as a, I want to wield this. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I'm not a fan. <laughs> it needs to, it needs to make sense for your brand, but it also needs to come from a place of caring. 
-hmm. because the people in your community, they can tell there's, they can tell when you actually genuinely care and you want to listen to them and you want to make things better for them versus I just need you all in the same room. Yeah. Good way to put it. Like the energy is very different. And I think what's interesting too, is there's very much a bit, there's very much a big difference between audience and community. So I think about, I saw someone talk about this on Twitter and it's, they, they came up with a really good option for it. I can't remember who it was, but it's, it's exactly how I would describe it too, where audience is very one directional. So you're thinking about like a stage and like, that's your audience, like you, your brand, whoever is speaking, you are singular and you are speaking out. And they might clap for you. They might give you those engagements, but you are not, you're not there to listen to them. You're there to say your piece and then you collect whatever reaction they give you. And that's, that's the only transaction that happens. That's it. Community is a living, breathing thing yeah. where yes, you can have some forms of hierarchy, but status, but people need to feel welcome. And no one feels welcome when they're not the center of attention. There's very much this idea of, um, I wrote a, I wrote a piece about like the psychology of community and there's, there's all these like major elements where you, you need to, you need to feel like you belong. Even introverts want to be invited. They're probably not won't come to the party because they know that it'll make them uncomfortable, but they want an invite. And then you have this like general narcissism that we all have where we want to feel included and we want to feel special and we want to see ourselves in that community so that we, when we enter, we're like, yeah, this is, this is where I belong. There's this core sense of belonging and belongingness that we need. And you can't feel that if no one cares, because if you are trying to build a community and that's, that's the beauty of community too, it's long-term, it's long game. So if you're in it for the wrong reasons, you're going to get tired and you're going to get sick of the effort. And like you said, you're going to give up. The people who are in it for long game and are doing it because they genuinely want to build those relationships with their customers or their fans or whatever it is. But if they genuinely care about them and care about that relationship, then they see community as an investment and they're going to continue to work on that and building that until it becomes a cohesive place where everyone feels like they can come together, they can belong. They can share ideas. They can share ways for things to be improved. That's the thing too, is community is this massive feedback loop. You're going to invite people into your space, either online or in a room or at a conference or wherever it is, but everyone's going to have an opinion and everyone's going to have their perspective that says, I love this, but I wish that you would do this. I love this, but I wish this was a little different. And that's okay. That's the beauty of community is you have those people come in together and then you have that innovation of new ideas and things that can constantly, constantly be improved because community is made of humans. So it's going to be a human experience. It's going to be changing depending on how, like if there's really bad news in one specific area of the country, and that's where you have a core group of community members, you're going to feel that. Maybe they're not, maybe if it's in like a bevy or if it's in a Facebook group or if it's somewhere else, you're going to feel it because maybe they're not there or maybe their, their tone is a little bit different or maybe they're even writing and being like, Hey guys, just want to let you know, like I'm here, but like, I'm not, not feeling it today. You can, you, and you can see that on Twitter too. If you spend a lot of time on Twitter, you start to learn people. I love Twitter because the fakes fall away really quickly. Mm. Because you're going to be on Twitter when you're sick and when you're sad and when you're angry and when you're happy and you're eventually like that real self that's not as curated is going to just like slowly bleed out. Like you're going to hear about my love of the food fighters and you're going to know if the, if the Hokies won or lost based on how I come to the Twitter that day. Like (laughs) you're going to know, I can't hide it anymore. It just, it spills out of my, it spills out of my words. So that's what I, that's what I genuinely love about that. And like I said, you have to come from a genuine place. It has to come from you genuinely wanting to build relationships with those people and listening to them. If if you want to build a community so you can be the emperor, you're not going to be happy. You're going to hate it. It's not going to go as fast as you want. You're not going to get the KPIs you want. Like you're not going to see the metrics and like the growth you want because it's never going to be fast enough because you want to be like the king or queen of this. It's never going to work that way. Community works best when you give more than you take. That's how you do it. Because where's the value add? Where's the value add if I'm just here 
to just like praise like this one person or this one community. Like it needs to feel like it's mutually beneficial for everyone. Yes, it helps the brand. It helps the brand learn more about their customer base. It lets the brand have ambassadors. It lets the, the brand have a higher voice of um, share of voice. There, eh, there's definitely some incredibly positive reasons why brands should create community, but it also needs to be beneficial for the community. It can't be one-sided. And that's what a lot of brands are starting to realize. I mean, McDonald's is doing an incredible job of that where they're doing, they're leaning into the strategy of really celebrating their fans. You saw it with the Super Bowl ad, you saw it with the, can I get a tweet? Like they are very much saying to their fans, we know exactly what you're like. We know what you, ex what your experience is like. We know how you order. We know how you go to that drive-through. We know what your life is like before you even go to McDonald's. That's really powerful to, to, to have your fan base that already loves you say, feel seen. That's incredibly powerful. That takes us fans to super fans. And then you don't need to do advertising. You have them. You have an army of people who can't wait to talk about how beautiful and great and fantastic and talented and amazing you or your product or your brand is because you make them feel special. Mm. Like that's just, you can't buy that and you can't build that overnight either. That takes time. Yeah. Well, that's a perfect transition. Um, in, in one of the articles that you wrote, you mentioned something along the lines of you build an army of fans of super mm -hmm. fans and mm -hmm. i totally agree with you there there's this weird dichotomy with community where what's the better play do you make this community for like vip you know there's a paywall here mm -hmm. this is access to something premium that the rest mm -hmm. of the people don't get or do you use this concept of community to build let's call them brand ambassadors let's mm -hmm. call them um, like almost free quasi influencers, people that mm -hmm. do marketing for you because mm -hmm. they're excited about your product or your service or your, or your idea or whatever. So tell me if I'm a regular person and I'm creating mm -hmm. a blog about fitness and mm -hmm. I'm starting to get some social media followers, I'm starting to build an email list and I'm saying to myself, huh, I wonder if I can create a premier community here where we all join this fitness journey together and we get access to these VIP workouts and we can all do it together. Or do I want to keep everything free and build a strategy that allows it that I, I build brand ambassadors, basically people that talk mm -hmm. about my workouts and, and my fitness routine for me, they both have their pros and cons mm -hmm. and they're both communities. So mm -hmm. like, where do I d make a distinction between the two? It's a really good question because a lot of brands are doing both. Yeah. So they're creating that, that influencer ambassador space. Can you give me an example? Adobe. Fucking Adobe. Adobe. They're so good at everything. <laughs> right Adobe does great. Adobe yeah. does really great work. So you could go on, you could go on Reddit and you can go on Facebook groups and you can go on Instagram and, and TikTok and all of these channels. And you'll find Adobe users that either that have come together to create their own micro communities um, separate from Adobe. Adobe doesn't own those channels, but they're still talking about it. They're sharing tips. Like YouTube is filled with people who can't wait to show you how to use an Adobe product. Yeah. Like if you ever wanted to know how to do anything on any Adobe product, YouTube has it somewhere. You just have to search. So there's, there's people who are already using their talent to be able to create those. So whether Adobe owns that community or not, it has such a large user base that those people celebrate their talent yeah. and ability to use that product. And they have, they have positioned themselves as users, as power users. So that in itself is a great way. And then in addition to that, Adobe has that more selective key piece, which is that Adobe Insiders piece. And these are those influencers that they're users, but they have like larger followings or they cater to a specific audience, whether that be higher ed or whether that be agency or enterprise clients, but they have their own specific like niche influencer piece. And so they're able to share and are able to create these opportunities for people to go to events like um, Adobe Max yeah. or, um, and then they, they act as like a think tank. They get to do beta tests for new features and they get to share their, uh, their ideas and opinions about 
like current projects. So I think, I think a lot, like depending on size and if you have the bandwidth, I love both where you have those, that larger influencer base that's far more niche, but it's able to share reach. And then you have that user base. And the fact is, is that Adobe loves both of them. Like Adobe benefits from both. So I, I like the idea of both because it's, it removes that exclusionary perspective. You may not be an Adobe Insider, but that doesn't mean you can't have a YouTube channel talk, yeah. showing what you do. It doesn't mean that you can't sh like celebrate your favorite work. It can't, it doesn't, because you're not in one doesn't mean you can't exist in the other. And for me, that's the power of community where you can be different, but you still have a place at the table, which is incredibly important. I feel like that's another thing that that's, that's been really helpful for Adobe as they continue to grow is that when you ask people, like you could do a post and be like, should I use Adobe or some other product? And you're, you don't have to wait for Adobe to respond and army shows up. Absolutely. Man, what a perfect example. I, I like, I have a real point on my podcast not to try to stump people. And so sometimes I was like, oh, was that your point? <laughs> yeah, I was like, did I just put her in a corner right now? But Adobe, like, wow, what a great example because Adobe's doing great work. They're doing great work. Well, they're a great company. Like, let's be real. Yeah. Adobe is all, and from a marketing standpoint and community standpoint, but also their products, like they just, mm -hmm. they're a great company. Um, their stock continues to do really well for obvious mm -hmm. reasons, but like, so I love what you said there where you can have both. However, mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier the investment of community. It's yeah. not just, so let's say, let's use that fitness example again. And mm -hmm. maybe you go on Money Networks, maybe you put a member press something together to create some mm -hmm. premium content. It's not as though what you're already doing just applies. Now you have to mm -hmm. level up, you have to show yeah. up every day. It's hard and it doesn't sound mm -hmm. like much. Like, oh, I just got to log in and ask a question and maybe post a quick video. I'm telling you. Yeah. Every single day, it gets, it gets really, really difficult. So mm -hmm. as much from a, let's call it like a, it, it makes sense that community is a great thing to offer for small brands. But I, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people get into it, not necessarily understanding what's in front of them. Because in order for yeah. it to really, really work to that point where it scales, where, you know, you're making real money, you need to do it consistently for like a year and a yes. half. Yes. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. It takes, it takes a lot of work and you have to determine what your goals are. So if you are in a position where you're like, Christina, that's a great answer, but I'm not Adobe. I don't have that money. I don't have that bandwidth. Exactly. I don't have that crew. What do I do? I'm going to be the strategist in the room and say, it depends. It really depends on what your goals are. So let's say that you want. Yeah, this aware. is great. Get, get so more you, specific for me here. I can do that. Cool. So if you want awareness, Let's say that you want awareness and you, you just want people to talk about you. You're still early days. You don't have a lot of money. You don't want to buy like every billboard and every Facebook ad you can, you can muster, but you need people to talk about your brand. That is a great opportunity for those micro influencers that do have some reach, especially if you're like in a smaller area, let's say that you're a small business. If you are looking at, if you're a small business and you need people to start talking about your brand, but you don't have a lot of money, reaching out to micro influencers that are specifically like within that region. So like Roanoke has a really big food scene and there are a lot of foodie accounts. So I could throw a rock and find a food influencer in Roanoke quite easily. If I wanted to start a new restaurant, having them in my pocket, taking pictures, showcasing what their thoughts are it can go a long way in establishing. So you get that awareness and you're able to establish yourself in a scene that's already been created. I love that. So I like that. Now imagine though that you have, you have awareness. People are talking about you. They know you exist, um, but you're maybe not standing out compared to other brands or other, other businesses in the area. You, People know you're there, they can find you on Google, your SEO is fine, but you're not really seeing the scale that you're wanting. That's when you're gonna need that more human touch. People know who you are and they know who these micro influencers are. So that influencer isn't really gonna carry as much weight now because mm -hmm. by that time people know who they are and also your competitors are probably using them. Yeah. That's, when, that's when word of mouth is gonna be huge for you. 
That's when getting good reviews. That's when building that trust level and having that on the boot, like on the ground level army is going to carry more weight because at that point, think about it. Finding out about a new business, something flashy is usually the easiest way because it makes you stop scrolling. You're like, oh, yeah. I know who that is. Okay, yeah, like cool. a pattern interrupt. Exactly. Exactly. It gets, if you want to get on the radar, the micro influencer group, awesome. People are already established. You can piggyback off of their, off of their clout and off of their awareness, off of their followers. You're great. But once you're established and people know who you are, now that they're in that consideration stage, now they know who you are. Now they're comparing you to others. So that influencer doesn't really carry as much weight because that influencer could work for either of you. That's when it's kind of come down to what are your actual customers saying? Who are the people who actually are paying you money? Mm. Who are the, who are the people who could be fans or could be super fans? What are they saying? Because a micro influencer tells me you exist, but your customers tell me how great you actually are. Yeah. And that's, that's, I love testimonials. I love testimonials. Word of mouth isn't going anywhere. I, I, honestly, word of mouth is the one type of marketing that continues to grow. It's always going to as well. I'm an SEO, yeah. build all my brands on SEO. And the thing I always say is like, great, you got them here. But if I'm not talking about you, I'm going to do all of this work for nothing. So like yeah. on you to yeah. have a great product, or a great service. So that people tell their friends at the dinner table or whatever. Yeah. And, and also like the thing about brands that are doing it wrong is they're making everything about themselves. Totally. If you, if you have a brand talking about how great they are, that may get like three, four, five, six likes. But if you have someone that quote tweets that and says like, oh, I love them. You're going to see like double, triple, quadruple the engagement because I trust that person more than I trust that brand. That brand isn't going to tell you how they suck. That brand isn't going to be like, let me show you what's actually happening. They're going to be like, look how great we are. This is awesome. Like they're not going to, they're not going to show the good and the bad customers will. So if a customer is vetting you and saying, no, 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 no. They say they're great. And they're being, the, they're being honest. They mm -hmm. are great. I love them. And here's why. Oh, it's huge. And so brand, that's the thing about brands, especially online and social is a lot of them use them for customer service, but they use them for negative customer service. So they'll put out those fires, but they won't water the plants. They won't water the flowers. I'm like, oh, retweet that person that just said you were amazing. It takes yep. you two seconds and you just got to share a testimonial that everyone that follows you, whether they're a customer or not, is going to get to see, like, be a fan of the fans. Like, that's the one thing I love when brands, when brands are a fan of the fans, it makes me so happy because I'm like, that's how you do it. That's what you do is you say, like, you're giving us money. We're giving you a good product. You're happy, but you don't have to do business with you. And we love you that you chose us. Sure. Cause you could choose someone else tomorrow. Like you have to love your customers and it goes back to community and goes back to building trust. And that's for brands of all sizes from that small mom and pop to that larger. And think about those, those small mom and pops that have been around for decades. What do they have that these big brands don't loyalty? Yep. They have loyalty. The people who are like, I will go there over anywhere else. I don't care if it costs more money. I will go there first. And that's because of loyalty. That's because they've over decades, they have built that army, whether they intended to or not, they have a core army of customers who love them and will go to them first. And that's, that's, it really depends on goals and depends on what you like, where you are in like the stage of your business. But that's, that's how I would do it. So this is beautiful. Um, let me go one level deeper. So okay. we have awareness, you know, you yeah. get some people talking about you, but there might not be some loyalty there. Once you get some customers into the door, you got the human touch. We're talking about testimonials. We're talking about um, just word of mouth, personal reviews. And okay, let's say we have that. But mm -hmm. from like a tactical standpoint, what mm -hmm. do you do to actually harness that? Because people talking about you is one thing, but as a business mm -hmm. owner, there are certain strategies and tactics I can use to amplify that, to make yes. those 10 people reach a thousand people, a hundred thousand people. Um, so, so for that person who's on the human touch stage that has some good customers, maybe it's a juice bar down the street. They got people coming in every day. They got, Oh, I love this place. I'm always going to come here. I come here after my spin session. Right. Mm -hmm. They got some happy customers. So what's the next like amplification stage? How do we take those 
50 people that are coming in every day and smiling and make those 50 people reach 50,000 people. UGC, user generated content. User. The brands, the brands that are using UGC, they tend to get a lot more engagement and they also make those people feel incredibly special. Yeah. So, so everyone loves to be talked about, right? Everyone loves to be talked about. Uh -huh. And th think about it. You post a normal picture. It doesn't matter how beautiful or styled it is. You'll have like your normal people who like it. But if you post an image, especially on Instagram, but if you post something that one of your biggest fans did, even if they have like three followers, they are going to tell every single person they have ever met that they can get in contact with within 24 hours that their picture was shared on your Instagram. And you're going to see a significant like spike in engagement because they want people to celebrate that picture because if they love it enough, then maybe they'll use your UGC again. So what you're doing is you're doing multiple things. You're freeing up your graphics team because they're not having to create content. They're able to actually be able to use the people in your um, that are that are customers and fans. You're getting to um, create content that you know will perform well because you know that those people are going to now act as amplifiers for it because they want to make sure that it doesn't fall flat. You also get to show your audience that you're paying attention to what they're posting online. And not only are you paying attention and liking it, but you are sharing it. So you're making them feel you're going from, I see you to, I want to put you on stage by yourself. Now, now you get to represent the brand. Now you get to be a part of that. And that's incredibly powerful. And that's, and that's what I love too, is when your brand, especially like on Instagram and just all of these, especially visual content, I love it, love it when the customers take over. Not that, not that like the brand lost control, but that the brand becomes a reflection of their customers. Sure, just got out of the way. Yeah, just like, you love this, let's do it. And we see this all the time. Like for instance, it was a really great one. So I think it was Target, but Target had like a prairie dress. And so when you go and do a review, you can upload pictures. And so these, these people were doing the prairie dress, but it was very much like Little House on the Prairie. And it was very much like styled and hilarious. Like they were mocking it, but it made the dress sell out because people were looking at their reviews. And just like they look at their reviews, they're going to look at the pictures too. Yeah. And and if you see, if, if you're a customer or a wannabe customer, if you can see yourself in the content, then you're more likely to feel welcome. Mm. So if I see a reviewer that's working for, that's, that has using a product and they do something, they have very similar pain points to me. They have very similar needs. And then they respond about that product in a positive way. Then I'm going to think, huh, I wonder if I could have the same experience because I'm going to be having the same use case. So it makes me think about that product in a completely different way than if the salesperson was like, well, you could do this and this and this same thing with images. If I go to a restaurant or I'm thinking about going to a restaurant and I see something and I see the pictures then I'm like, that's really cool. I'm probably going to like, I know that that's what it's going to look like. That's probably what I'm going to order. I'll go there. I'll order that. That looks amazing. Yeah. But it also, it also shows the brand has kind of let go of that control. Yes. They're going to pick the best looking pictures. Absolutely but they didn't have any impact in how that original picture was going to look mm. like they couldn't tell it like, all right, can you do it at the, like this lighting and like move the fries around? Yeah. Like, can you do it with that glass? Get of that wine? like smoke uh, in the background. Exactly. <laughs> like they don't like, you don't know. So being able to utilize those and share those and then you see it and you're like, oh, I could kind of create something very similar to that. I could have a very similar experience it's, it's powerful. So you, for that, like next step, UGC, 100%. You know what I really appreciate about this conversation so far, Christina, I, I had two people come on my podcast recently that have joined this community rush. And I'm not saying this to say bad about anybody by any means. I, I respect everybody's work and what they're doing, but there's, layers to building a community where it's not just a thing that, like you said, a buzzword, like there are actual yeah. practical, pragmatic approaches that you can take to make it so that people feel something mm -hmm. about a brand. It's yeah. not just, you need to build a community. You need to get your likes. You need to get your reshares. It's more than that. There's, there's yeah. KPIs to hit. There's like yeah. metrics because it's difficult because how do you measure emotion? 
and we yeah. do it by likes and shares. You know, that's kind mm -hmm. of our, our yeah, it's bread and butter. Yeah. It's like our made up metric on how people feel, but yeah. it also is more than that because likes and shares don't necessarily determine, like I said, what I, what we talk about at the dinner table, you know, mm -hmm. like the things that my wife and I talk about when we eat, they have a big impact on the things that mm -hmm. we buy and the things that, that we communicate with. So yeah. you laid out for us, I think is so important because it's anti buzzworthy or excuse me, anti buzzword. It's like a systematic approach on how to make people feel something about your brand to the point where they go from their phone to the dinner table. And those are the brands that stick around forever, right? Like Apple mm -hmm. doesn't even advertise. Well, I yep. think they do now, but they never did. It's yeah. just people feel so engaged about their message that they mm -hmm. spread it amongst themselves. And keeping, keeping tabs on that, caring and social listening. I'm a massive fan of social listening. You have to be able to be open to feedback and be able to see what's happening and know that you're going to see comments that are not positive, some that are super positive, and be able to see all of this as an opportunity. Yeah. Anytime a customer or an almost customer is talking to you and saying something positive or negative, it's an opportunity for you to learn and see, like if they're saying something negative, where's the gap? Yeah. Where, did we, where did we fail them? What can we do that can improve that situation for them, that can improve that experience for them? It is all a learning opportunity to be able to, to bridge that gap. And, and even if you build that community, let's say that you get that community built up, you still have to work. Yeah, because as soon you still, as you stop, it'll just disappear. You still have it's to work. Brutal. Like you, you still have to show it. So like, for instance, like marketing Twitter, if people, people are still responding to that tweet and I'm still reacting the way that I did that first day, I'm still quote tweeting, I'm still saying welcome, I'm still doing whatever I wanted, but what would happen if I stopped? If I just like ignored it and was like, y'all, I'm tired, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> mm. What would happen? Yeah. It, would, it would fall apart, it would exist outside of me, it would do something. You would probably see like fractures, or whatever, but the value is that the community, you're building an ecosystem Love and it. you, and you need to continue to make sure it gets enough water and it has, it has the soil and the nutrients it needs. It has the value add. That's what you're building. And that isn't built in a day and it isn't cultivated in a day. And it, it doesn't just, it's long game. It is the definition of long game. And that's why a lot of people are using that word. But when they realize the like the lengths it takes and the tactics it takes and the care and the nurturing it takes, there's going to be a lot less people talking about community in a couple of years because they're like, guys, I can't do this anymore. I'm tired. I agree, I agree totally. So, so let me let me wrap up on this one. You're obviously very mm -hmm. passionate about this. Out of mm -hmm. all the people that I've talked to, um, you bring forward the most practical advice, as I've just <laughs> mentioned. Uh, there. You're, you're really on to something. So do you consider yourself professionally a social media manager? Do you consider yourself a community manager? Are you inventing like a new field for yourself right now? I'm curious about when you lay down at night and you think about these things and you see the big picture in your head on like where you want to be, where's this yeah. heading for you? For me, I, titles are hard because yeah in the marketing space, titles are all over the place. Like someone who's a community manager for one place is doing social, is doing graphic design, is doing something else. So titles are hard. I can only say that like 10 years from now, I'd love to be a chief community officer. I'd love for it to be established. Community is that a thing? Kind of, kind almost of? not. Well, there's, um, there's one or two people that have one that have that title. Um, I'm not there yet. I still have a lot to, a lot of time to grow. It's but it's not as widespread as like a chief marketing officer or a CEO. But I would love for community to have that person at the C suite, to have it at that level where they are they get to make sure that you're that or or like a chief customer officer. There are brands that have chief customer officers and I love that title for me or for anybody because your customer needs to be at that table. Yeah. You are the representation of the customer in the C-suite. Yes. You need that person. <laughs> no matter who, no matter who it is, but no matter who it is, yeah. whether it's me, whether it's you, whether it's somebody else, brands forget to make sure that there's a seat at the table for their customer. And there always needs to be one because 
there, it's so easy for marketers to market to themselves. To, to write copy, they're like, I love this. I'm I like, love yeah, this. But I'm not the customer. <laughs> I'm not the target audience. So me liking it, it's like, eh, that doesn't mean it's going to hit. Yeah. So having someone who is always has their, has their finger on the heartbeat of the customer, knows their pain points inside and out, knows what they're facing, knows what the current, like, um, comments, positive and negative are, and knows, like, at, w- at any moment's notice can say, how are the customers feeling about this specific feature or that specific feature? Or what do they think about for, like, the roadmap of the product or the company? That's important. That's important to have someone there because you need the customer to have a seat at the table. For community, I see myself as a community builder. That's, that's my title. I, it's building. It's one brick at a time. It's one person at a time. It's listening. It's trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. All that wall isn't going to work there. I need to tear that down and start something else. It's building. I would say if you made me choose, I would say I'm a community builder. Well, we'll stick with that for now. (laughs) When you said chief community officer, though, I'm like an emotional person. When I close deals (laughs) and stuff like that, I end up like throwing pillows around my office. (laughs) wife can hear me like, ah, you know, like, is this a good scream, bad scream, good scream, <laughs> good scream. Yeah. I just, I just get really emotional about seeing people succeed and about like really great things in life. So when you said that this like rush of adrenaline came over me, I was like, Christina's going to be the chief community officer, you know? So, um, we'll call you a community builder right now, but 10 years from now, I really, really feel strongly I can envision you being at a seat on somewhere as this title that you quite literally invented and like manifested into the ethos. So, um, so congratulations and, uh, and you're really cool. I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. No, this was awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Okay. Hold on. Um, let's do the, um, shit. I thought I wrote all your stuff down. Your Twitter. You're fine. Yeah. Um, that, that Chris, I'm that Christina G on Twitter and Instagram. And my Instagram's really, it's not marketing focused. It's lots of trees and nature and don't, don't expect marketing quotes on my, on my Instagram. It's not happening. Yeah, absolutely. I will link all of that in the show notes of the post, uh, to see those show notes, go to timstodscom slash Christina dash Garnett. And mm-hmm. I will have all of that uh, linked up there. Christina, once again, thank you so much for your time. Um, thanks for having me. Fresh air. I appreciate it. Oh, good. Thanks. See ya.